yeah. sitting on the front row. <clears throat> Pressure was on. Good morning, everyone. We're just um, waiting for more of you to join and we'll kick off quite shortly. Good morning, everyone. If you're just joining now, we're going to wait a couple of minutes until um, more of you have, have, have been able to join us. <clears throat> Good morning. Thanks to those of you who are still joining us. We're just going to hold on a couple of minutes for um, or to allow more of us to, to, to join before we kick things off. If any of you have uh, encountered Zoom issues on the way in, um, <laughs> a vicarious sorry on my behalf. Good morning to those of you who are still joining us. We're just going to hold on a couple of minutes um, until more of you can join. So we'll just wait two or three minutes more before we kick things off. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We'll be kicking off in just a minute or two. For those of you who joined us earlier, I've probably said that five times, so thank you for your patience. Give us a few moments more. I'm going to wait until it ticks over to 33 and then we will give it a whirl. And 33 it is. So let's kick things off. Good morning to you all. Um, thanks to those of you who are joining us. This is the third in our seasonal series of Lunch on the Learn webinars. Um, great to see so many of you here, and I'm sure a few more will join in the next few minutes. Um, you know, we're really acutely aware of how precious your time is, particularly so in a post COVID world. So um, thank you for coming, uh, particularly also as we start to approach the, the end of many of your financial years. Um, a really quick intro. My name's Ben. Um, I'm an ex-head of comms myself. Um, I moved over to leading communications recruiters VMA group uh, in 2021, where I now specialise in interim and contract assignments, uh, largely in external comms and everything within that. Um, as professional communicators, I suspect virtually everyone on the call today um, will have endured at least one crisis situation. Um, and in truth, in many cases, a good deal more than that. Um, we know that navigating complex crises is a core component of effective communications, um, and it's really a, a fundamental part of our craft. Uh, in recent years, it's fair to say we've entered an era of acute reputational risk. And so the role that effective comms teams play 
has become even more critical as those geopolitical plates yeah. continue to shift and the world lets you from one wholly unprecedented event right into the next. Um, indeed, a, a good old fashioned crisis is often the prism through which organizations and by extension their comms teams are viewed uh, and judged. So today, we're really, really delighted to welcome Andrew McConnell, who is the Deputy Director for Communications and Engagement, and his colleague, Media Lead, Robert Crawford um, from the UK Civil Aviation Authority. Thank you to you both for coming. Um, both have built a wealth of experience at the sharp end in their careers to date, including playing really pivotal roles in some of the most headline grabbing crises of recent years. Um, so they're here to share some of that experience with us um, and back, perhaps encourage us all to, to think a little bit again about how we approach communications when things um, inevitably go wrong. Um, naturally, there'll be a chance for you all to fire off any questions into the Q&A box, if you'd be so kind. Um, as, the, as the session progresses. If you do that, if you just give us your name and your organisation, that'd be really, really helpful. Um, and actually during the session itself, there'll be several opportunities for you to get involved and to have your say on critical issues um, by using our live polls. So please do join in with those if you can. Um, and so without any further ado whatsoever, I'm gonna hand over to Andrew and Robert. Brilliant, thank you, Ben. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. We're gonna jump straight in uh, by, by in a question to you. Why should we care about crisis communications? Uh, a recent World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report actually found that 54% of us anticipate some instability and moderate risk uh, over the next two years. Uh, a further 30% also said uh, over the next two years that they expect more turbulent conditions. Um, and then it got even worse, um, potentially over the next 10 years, there's a more negative outlook uh, that could be stormy. So we're going to kick off with our first poll um, and put it to yourselves. Uh, and what we'd like to ask you is what are your current organisation risks or potential crises um, in your organisation at present? And later in the poll, we'll probably come back to these findings as we look at some of our own organisational uh, risks. So if you could hit the buttons now, we'll give it a couple of minutes uh, before we, we slowly move on. Hopefully that's everyone voted. Cool, brilliant. And just we'll move on to our uh, first example, which Andrew's uh, going to discuss. Thanks, Rob. So first of all, who are the Civil Aviation Authority? Where you know what what do we do? You may have you may have heard us, but just a little ex explanatory. You know we are the uh, UK's uh, aviation uh, and aerospace uh, regulator. Uh, we've been around for 51 years uh, and our uh, work in space, uh, we became the space regulator just two years ago. But in essence, uh, what is it we do? If it flies, it's in the air, it's regulated uh, by us as the regulator. So uh, we play a crucial role um, uh, in, in supporting uh, the industry um, and our role, our mission statement is about protecting people and enabling uh, aerospace. So 51 years uh, we've been around, and uh, yes, we've certainly gone through uh, a number of crises, and uh, uh, we want to just uh, talk you through, you know, perhaps the most significant one, I think, for, for us as a regulator, particularly in my time uh, here, and also just some other things, uh, reputational risk that we've had. So I want to take you back uh, to, uh, to a few years ago, uh, the airline Thomas Cook, and uh, Thomas Cook was um, one of the most major tour operators uh, here within uh, the UK. Uh, unfortunately, that October day, uh, the business uh, where collapsed and uh, and uh, you know causing quite a lot of people to be made redundant and uh, a lot of people uh, out on their holidays. And uh, we had to do this uh, previously for Monarch Airlines and uh, for uh, for Thomas Cook. It was a massive global operation um, that we had. So what was what was the situation um, that we faced? Uh, 150,000 uh, British holidaymakers around 40 or different countries, all the way from Cuba to the Greek islands to Spain, a you know, massive uh, operation uh, for us. 
And including this, we had 1 million people with future bookings. So a massive responsibility uh, to actually come back. So the government uh, said in this situation, we want you to bring everyone home. The scale is so big, regardless of whether they've got the atoll financial protection, we want British uh, holidaymakers to be brought at home. Civil Aviation Authority, uh, can you step in and run this operation for us, uh, which was called Operation uh, Matterhorn. And I have to say, I'm really pleased to see um, some colleagues uh, who helped uh, on that uh, that uh, project with us are actually on today's call. And I hope that uh, uh, they'll also, you know, uh, sort of answer you know, some of the questions and, and, and uh, be play an active part in this presentation. So what was uh, our role, uh, our role as, as the regulator? So we had to coordinate uh, the cross-government uh, response. Uh, we had to uh, attain COBRA. I was, uh, there's two types of COBRA, uh, the one that you see on television where the Prime Minister holds, but also an official's COBRA. And I took an active part um, in that, making sure that communications was at the heart of everything uh, we do here and a part of um, the operation. Supporting you know, the airports, you know, it's a global situation through uh, our colleagues at the Department of Transport, we made sure that uh, posters were ready to roll out, uh, announcements were ready to be made at, at airports, social media feeds ready to sort of roll uh, once we knew that the company was, was going into administration. Um, we as a regulator, so we licensed that company, so we knew uh, that uh, that our company was was going to collapse for, for a certain period. Um, so we had a bit of time to prepare for the situation. Working with the administrator, uh, one of the biggest headaches um, that uh, we thought was going to be quite a challenge for us was every single Thomas Cook High Street shop had a social media account. So over 150 social media accounts, uh, as well as the company's brand that we had to do. So it's making sure that once the airline uh, had collapsed, Civil Aviation Authority stepped in um, and supported consumers, and that was our role for a two-week period. So what did we do? We launched a website, Single Source of Truth, uh, one, one place that people can come to with all of the information uh, they had on it. We launched a media campaign. We put a TV studio um, in our office. Uh, when you have such a global situation like that, we're based here in Canary Wharf, obviously TV stations around the country. We knew that actually uh, sending spokespeople around to Millbank or different locations just wasn't going to work. So we established our own TV studio uh, here within the sort of the Canary Wharf um, estate. And then it was that multi-channel uh, approach. What did we need to do? Uh, holiday makers, we all have our social media on different different various channels. So whether you were you know, a younger person, you know, and on Instagram or you're a Facebook, we had to make sure it was a multi-channel uh, campaign that uh, we we launched. So how do we do it? We said we had the TV station, we had a social media ch channel, we, we, we operated a 24-7 uh, media operation through a two-week period, supporting our colleagues here and the government's uh, res response. And I have to say the reason why we, we it was successful was those 10 people that we brought in to help in this situation. And I am very grateful to VMA who uh, supported us at very short notice of getting communications professional in to support uh, this, uh, this activity. But what did we do in, that, in, those, uh, in those early days? 150 uh, media interviews within the first 24 hours. So 10 trained spokespeople uh, were ready to do uh, TV, radio, all around uh, the world. It was a massively issues uh, rich uh, situation. We had an earthquake in that two week period. We had hostage situation. I'll never forget that uh, that uh, people in Cuba um, uh, and uh, the ambassador uh, rang us and said that people are hostage, that uh, they're not going to be allowed to go to the hotel, to jump on your, your plane you've organised um, because the bill needs paying for the hotel here. And, they hadn't heard of the Civil Aviation Authority uh, in Cuba, so the government had to go go down there. And the only way to sort it was the ambassador gets on his bicycle, because there was a fuel crisis at the time, with his government credit card to, to let everyone out of the hotel so they could fly home. So it was a really issues-rich situation we had. We even had a stranded dog as well that we needed to, uh, uh, to get back to the UK as well. So uh, those involved here, it was a very memorable two weeks um, that, that we had. But what do we do? What was it? What we did? You know, it was 
it was a, a pop-up island airline was created. It had to be done in secret. Uh, you know, we couldn't tell other UK operators um, that we're going to set up this, this uh, pop-up airline. 40-odd airlines were used from around the world um, to help uh, this operation, all done in secret until we're ready to go. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a, a mammoth operation um, for the comms team here at the Civil Aviation Authority. But what did we uh, learn from that situation? And, and, you know, we are one of our values here at the CAA is ever learning. And it was identifying that key message. And so our message was very clear. If you're abroad on holiday, don't worry, we're going to bring you home. Check our website, information's on there. If you're due to go on your holiday, it's a very clear message. Don't go to the airport. Unfortunately, holiday's cancelled. Uh, and so we had some very, very clear messaging um, on that. And I remember... Uh, the Jeremy Vine program saying, ah, to our chairman, everyone's stranded. Well, actually, no one was stranded. 97% of the people that were on holiday, we brought back home on the same day um, that they had booked through Thomas Cook. So we're really proud of that operation. But what did we do? We made sure we, our key messages was really, really clear. We cultivated those relationships. And that was you know, working across government as well. We had embeds from different government um, uh, organizations here within our office here in Canary Wharf. Transparent messaging, that single source of truth website, that was the go-to. 40 million people visited that website um, through that two-week period. But it was up to date, it was consistent, it was very clear, easy to read. And we made sure that we had servers around the world um, to, to support that. So I remember the Times newspaper ringing me up and saying, ah, oh, well, you know, it's a failed already. Well, actually, the website hadn't failed at 3 a.m. in the morning. It was the servers that were already working. <clears throat> our priority was not the UK at that time. It was getting our message out to people uh, abroad. And we were very, very successful. In fact, uh, in fact, that journalist now has become one of our uh, most well-respected and, uh, and writes a lot about the CAA. And so how you can build that relationship is really important. Um, influencers, we all sort of um, look at and we get challenged, particularly here, you know, influencers. Why do we want to use influencers? And actually, if you watch television in a crisis, you'll see the BBC or Sky News roll out an expert. Um, and um, what we found is very helpful is to know who those experts go on television and brief them. And uh, throughout that two week period, we, we had separate bespoke briefings for those people going on television, helping with that single uh, uh, sort of source of truth, making sure that they were able to say, yep, the operation's going fine. Yep, <clears throat> this is the website. Uh, and, and that was something I would say, if anyone has a crisis, use your influencers <clears throat> because they can really amplify your message. Your chief exec might not always want to go on television straight away, but the BBC and other outlets will have somebody talking about it. Contact them immediately. Send them your message. Send them your statements. Keep in touch with them. You know, we we still are. Many of the influencers from days of Thomas Cook, uh, we still keep in touch with uh, to date. So that's a little bit of a sort of, you know, what we did. It was the largest peacetime repatriation. It was a massive operation here for the CAA and something we are very you know proud of. It's something we don't want to do uh, again, but unfortunately, you know, way, as Rob mentioned at the beginning of the first slide, you know, the industry, you know, the global economic situation uh, is there. So we test, we are ready uh, for another uh, scenario such as this. We have airlines around the world already on standby, uh, ready to support an operation, should uh, we ever have to do it again. Um, but we are very proud of, of, of what we did and certainly the team here at the CA and, and all the the, the colleagues that that, that EVMA found for us. It was a truly fantastic operation. We're very proud. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some good lessons people can learn from these. And uh, we hope with just that snapshot I've just talked about uh, may be helpful to you. Now, just moving on, we're going to give you a, a, another case study uh, that was a bit of a reputational challenge for us here at the CAA. Uh, when we took on new powers uh, as a space regulator uh, that Andrew touched on at the start. That happened in July of 2021. Um, and since then, there was obviously a really big build-up of when UK launch would happen. Uh, that happened uh, in January 2023. But there was a lot of industry, government and stakeholder push and pull on when that launch uh, would actually happen. Uh, we got tangled up 
in a little bit of that, which I will come on to um, shortly. Um, Spaceport Cornwall, as it says there, received its first UK license uh, from us, followed by Virgin Orbit. And then if you recall, the launch took place. Um, and despite um, the, the, the rocket failing uh, to reach orbit, it was actually uh, a successful operation because it failed um, safely. Obviously, Virgin Orbit, unfortunately, uh, are no more with us, uh, having declared bankrupt um, in April. But but what was the narrative uh, that we were facing? We had several reputational risks um, here. As you can see, with some of the uh, headlines um, at the bottom of this presentation, that the UK was seen as a top place for, for satellite launches. Uh, the UK's uh, space launch sector faces burden of complexity. Um, so a lot of the kind of conversations and a lot of the, the media were focused on what the Civil Aviation Authority was doing. Why are they holding it up? Why haven't you licensed uh, Virgin Orbit yet? Why can't a launch happen? Um, the issue that we, we, we faced was that we didn't comment on licensing. We wouldn't comment on applications. We wouldn't comment on where we were in the kind of process. Or, or anything like that. And as I mentioned, there was a lot of third party pressure that made it look like we were holding up um, the plans. There was also different stakeholders um, politically, um, as well as within the industry that we needed to kind of involve and bring on the journey with us um, in a sense. And it was making sure that they understood uh, what, what they could expect from us. So how did we change that negative into a positive? Um, we hosted several background briefings with journalists, as we've already mentioned previously about how, how we continue to build relationships with journalists. And we had to do that um, within the space sector. There was a whole new, whole new host of journalists that we were engaging with uh, from science backgrounds um, and so forth. We, we looked at how could we explain the licensing process and what we were doing a little bit further. Um, and I'll come on in a minute, some of the lessons that we learned from this. And it was a case of looking at social media, how could we use that tool to explain to uh, not only journalists, but also the public what it is we're doing uh, in a simple manner. And that worked really effectively um, for us. We also upped our <clears throat> political engagement uh, to be a bit more proactive um, and be on the front foot to, to engage with MPs, engage with select committees um, who, who uh, obviously uh, pulled us in. Um, at one point, and, and it wasn't a great hearing, I must be to be brutally honest with you, um, but we managed to turn that around and, and the when the report actually came out, it was actually a very, very positive, um, positive kind of report uh, for the CIA. So we become, we, become, we become more transparent as that kind of final bullet point um, outlines there. But what did we learn? What did we learn from, from, from this process? What did, what did we do, as, as, as kind of pointed out? We did our research. We use social uh, media listening tools to look at what was being said about us on, on social media. We also looked um, using our media monitoring uh, platform at what was actually being said about us, who was writing about us, who could, should we be speaking to, um, and so forth. And, and one of the key things from this is, look, don't operate in a vacuum. Make sure that you are talking to journalists, make sure that you are speaking to your key stakeholders to make sure that they do understand what you are doing um, and then you were able to build communications um, off the back of that. Uh, the third bullet point there is, is rebut when appropriate. Uh, we had several journalists writing incorrect information once uh, we had issued the license. They were still saying that we were holding it up, but actually with the operational readiness um, of, of Virgin Orbit itself, um, so rebut when appropriate. And one of the things we did do was uh, issue a public statement when, when Virgin Orbit did come out quite publicly um, about something about the, the, the process and the delays and everything like that. And then the other one there, know your audiences and channels. And I say this because knowing your audience is probably one of the most important um, most important things to, to know. We, we From our research, we knew who was writing about us. We knew um, who was talking about us on our social channels, who we could target uh, through through posting on, on our video on social media, but also who we would need to bring in to actually speak to um, and actually engage with, with background briefings to help them understand what the actual uh, process was. And again, similar to Andrew's point, um, use influencers to advocate for you. They've, they can be very, very important people to be able to say some things that you might not be able to. Um, so again, we would really like to reiterate um, that message. So hopefully that's 
a little bit of an insight. It's not as much as a, a crisis, but it's a crisis that could have happened if we hadn't managed to, to, to change the narrative. And then just moving on, um, we asked you earlier, what are your kind of crisis areas you, that you are looking at? And I would like to imagine that, that some of the responses back are very similar to what we are we are kind of planning for. Uh, and one of the things I'd kind of say is <clears throat> always test, scenario plan, um, and look at what, what the risks are in your area. So some of the things I've got down there is misinformation and disinformation. And, and what I'd like to add to that is, is we do, and I'd imagine some other, other people on the call are, are probably seeing this too, that the, the, the kind of current media landscape is, is very much push stories out very quickly. And so we're seeing a lot of misinformation, disinformation in articles, uh, a large uptick in journalists actually not reaching out to us and and, and getting that kind of background or, or asking for a statement from us. Um, so, yeah, you, you will. We do see a rapid spread of false information. Uh, another point there is cyber attacks. Uh, only recently we, we, we worked with our kind of cyber team. Um, to tighten up our, our kind of potential response to any any cyber attacks we, we may face. Um, extreme weather events as well can impact the aviation and aerospace in industry. We only saw last year the forest fires in, in the likes of Greece and the impacts that that had, and we were we were in tuned and switched on in that, and we had to make sure that, that people had the right information um, on that. Geopolitical conflict uh, and economic downturn as well. They're, they're, they're just some of the things... Uh, that we're looking at, looking at, and potentially scenario planning um, around. And I will hand back uh, to Andrew just to finish off this presentation. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, we just wanted just to sort of uh, put to you, how would you respond? And just I wanted just to talk through some of the things that I've seen on TV recently or have been experienced um, in my own uh, career. So before working uh, in aviation, I was in rail and I was one of the station managers at King's Cross on the day of the London bombings. And those days we didn't have social media. It wasn't Twitter and X and Facebook and things like that. All the phone lines went down. And the challenge I've always had here is how would you respond if our phone lines went down? All the computers went down, the phones went down. How would we do? So what we do, we make sure our PR distribution for news service is on a separate server we use pr glue so i'd give a free advert there um but we have that because if, because if something happens here at the caa we know that we can go there and post our news uh, out to journalists uh, through that medium so you know i was there on the front line i can tell you no phones no communication nothing was available you had to think on you know uh, uh, you know as things uh, develop um, Asiana air crash, you know, not many people know this one back in uh, 2013, Asiana was coming to land into San Francisco airport, unfortunately uh, uh, crashed as it landed. That was on CNN news 20 seconds after the crash. You know, aviation geeks around the world at airports got it. It was on CNN before anybody could issue a statement. So as an organization, are you ready? Do you have holding statements ready to go for the variety of situations that we've got. And a little bit interesting one, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, how vacuum, you know, can be can be something that uh, that if you don't respond quickly, it can turn into an even bigger story. And, you know, just uh, as recently this week, you know, a fish and chip shop uh, over on the other side of London uh, had a union flag uh, painted outside, um, you know, Sounds a good idea, but actually it's in a conservation area. Um, how long did it take for that council to respond? Two and a half days before they put a social media post out. Actually, the answer is it's a conservation area. These kind of things be allowed. Very sorry. But actually, the vacuum that's allowed, we've had politicians from all sorts of political parties uh, jumping on the story and saying how outrageous it is. So you know, two and a half days isn't great to, to before you put your first statement out. So go back to that. How would you respond? Are you ready? A good example this week, you know, we've seen, you know, cyber issues with uh, with with supermarkets and things like that. And I, I, you know, personally think that a good example is Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's this week, you know, had their issue. They were on the front foot. Chief executive response, apologising for the issue with a voucher and saying sorry really quickly. And I think that is something that we can all uh, look at as, as, as a win for that particular company. Really challenging because my own saying was this weekend, it, it was chaos. But actually having your chief executive stand up, say sorry, deal with it, 
your reputation uh, whilst may take a dent, but your customer loyalty is something people are going to go, okay, it wasn't great, um, but they show they cared. So the question to you is, how would you have responded um, in, in, in these situations? So we've got another poll, I think, now. Yep, another poll, if we could just get that up on the, on the screen. <clears throat> Robert and Andrew, just while um, everyone submits their choices, just to let you know that I don't think our viewers can see the results of the polls. So if you could share those with them once you have them, that would be really helpful. Great, thank you for that poll. I hope that was, you know, helpful. Also, just opens our, our thought. Can we look at the results? Sure, we can see them here, but Ben, maybe you can see them at your your end. I can't, but I'm sure that we will fix that particular gremlin and we'll share those results with everyone as soon as we get them. In the meantime, Great. gents, thank you very much. It was a really fascinating session. Loads of very current, very topical content. Now, here come the results, actually. I'll stop talking. So the second poll first, how quickly do you believe your organisation could respond to a major crisis? So 19% within 30 minutes, which is a pretty decent outcome, Andrew. Within yeah, I mean... Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that. I mean that, 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 that is it. It is making sure you, you, you've, you've got that response. And... For for the for the the three percent at the bottom, you know, not at all. I hope this has been a you know helpful, insightful uh, for you. Um, you know, we, we have to do this press day, but come and talk to us. Uh, you know, if you want to um, uh, get some you know case studies how how it's done, you know, feel free to to reach out to us because uh, let's let's help turn that three and five percent out and uh, and and in, in the top poll and all, you know all those communicators support support each other so interesting result there um but uh, thanks for, for that engagement but that's it all from us unless there's any you know questions um uh, we're happy to take absolutely um yeah thanks chats as i say loads of really interesting content with you know a genuine global well, in some cases into interplanetary reach so thank you for sharing all of that um, as Andrew said, the floor is open for questions, so please feel free to fire them in. You can send them through in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A, um, and we'll just give you a couple of minutes to see what comes through. In the meantime, uh, we've had a couple of questions, so let me pitch the first one to you guys. Um, it was great, this is from an anonymous person, it was great to hear a bit more about how you use the experience of working with the media in crisis mode um, to build longer term relationships with key journalists. Can you just flesh out a little bit of, a little bit of detail uh, uh, as to how you went about that? So I think it's about in the sector we operate. So transport aviation, it's very it's very clear who who they are. What what we do is we have a rolling engagement program. So myself and Rob go out and engage with journalists all the time. And we've seen particularly the pandemic has changed because a lot of journalists want to sit behind a screen like this um, and actually go and have a cup of a cup of coffee with them makes a massive Good. difference tell them your story tell them what what you've got coming up once you once you do that you start to learn and build trust i can a good example of the press association we meet them on a regular basis we have a very trusted relationship with them they know that they can't break our embargoes but what they do do is when we have a story we can say that something's coming our way your way uh, we can brief you on it and that really, really has been made very successful in helping us get much more coverage. And so we have built and continue to build journalist engagement, but it's face to face. It's uh, it's very focused um, and targeted and very long term. Uh, there's some travel journalists. Uh, uh, we work here at the CA. I've known them since I started my PR career 15 years ago. And they are long term relationships, but also find out a little bit about them. What do they like? What sort of stories? Um, are they interested in? Um, uh, I, you, you follow perhaps, you know, uh, there's a uh, Nigel who is the travel editor of the Daily Mirror will often put on his uh, uh, Twitter feed, story spiked, 
um, because people just send lots of press releases. They don't look at the headlines and journalists get hundreds and hundreds uh, of press releases ev every day. When they get it from somebody who they know, uh, you know, be, be, be a name in an organization. We rarely use the uh, spokesperson. We put a name to things um, that we do. We personalize it. We have those relationships with the journalists. They're long-term, they're trust and enduring relationships. Sometimes they can be challenging as we've, as, as we've had to deal with, but actually going out there, building those relationships makes a massive difference um, for the organization. Um, and if you haven't got that, start with your, who's in your top 10? Who's writing about you the most? Start with top 10, top 20, top 50. Exactly. Um, as you will probably be able to see now, we've got the results of the first poll there as well. Um, so in terms of the top global risk to your organization at present, we've got cyber attacks, 40% of you, uh, which is a fairly chunky majority, economic, political and public unrest at 31%, um, and then the rest kind of bringing up the rear, uh, led by AI or te technology, technological advances with 13%, extreme weather and climate change at just 11%, which I'm slightly surprised about, um, ge geopolitical conflict at 5%. Any, any thoughts on those chaps? No, that's, that's it's really interesting. I'm not. I'm really not surprised at the cyber and economic side of things, given uh, the world we live in um, at the moment. I must admit, I'm quite surprised. I, I, I did think the uh, AI and new technologies might be a uh, more of a risk uh, that for, for people. I know it is for potentially for us here with with the likes of EV tolls and drones and new operations in the aviation and aerospace world. So it just just highlights the difference um of, of organizations uh and what are on their radio but it is clear that the two stand out is, is cyber i assume with the, the issue i think there was greg's went down uh the other day actually uh, from a cyber attack and obviously the economic political system um as well so no very interesting results thanks robert um on to another question now from jen harvey joshi thank you for that jen harvey what are your thoughts around using ai in crisis comms Oh, that is a very good question. So we use it currently um, at the minute from a, just a, probably an idea standpoint. So I'm not quite sure uh, the world will be in, 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 a, in a crisis. We could kind of tend to use it to actually think, right, what could we say or what could we kind of do? So it's, it's you can use it to, to your benefits, but I don't know how useful it would be in a crisis situation because I think sometimes you just need to get in a room with the people within your organisation and actually chat through that crisis. Um, we're currently looking at something um, at the minute and been scenario planning, and it's been more helpful to actually talk to people rather than use AI. So I don't know the place it'll have. But I think AI can be helpful for things like when you have websites. So, for example, we talked about Thomas Cook, we had uh, 360 million pounds worth of refunds. Um, actually, AI can be quite useful for auto responses and things like that. Um, and uh, there is now technology. So, example, if we have that tomorrow, we we uh, have a call center. It's great that they're there to um, to help. But actually, AI can be useful to help generate those responses. Um, and I know an airline recently, I was in touch with one, and it was AI. They can be quite frustrating though. I think at the moment you're going, oh, I just want to speak to a real person. Um, so uh, so I think I think as we, as comms develops, you know, I, my own career, who remembers using the BlackBerry, who's got the, the Nokia phone, you know, technology is changing, we all have to embrace it. And I think as we go forward in, in technology, AI is certainly gonna have a role to play. Um, at the moment for us, it's very limited. Yeah. Thanks both. Um, next question is from Catherine Rennie. Thanks, Catherine. I used to work for AWE. The challenge was always that a true crisis cannot be shared, which damages trust. How do you deal with sharing just enough to help with reputation and trust when you can't share the really problematic information? I think it is, it is those, it is those, I mean, we, we have particularly about 10 transport correspondents who uh, who uh, they're all funny. They're all on a WhatsApp group. So when when you ring one up, they'll go, "Oh, have you spoken to?" And, and, and they're all there. They they they're all there. So is that that enduring relationship that you that you've got? It is not easy, but when you've been around an organisation, you know, for a number of years, or you've got a relationship, you know a bit about them, you build that trust. We 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 do media briefings. So one thing that when we have maybe some stories, we'll bring say, "Right, come on, everybody." 
We'll bring that pool in. You're our trusted journalists. We will give you our chief executive to brief you. If any of you break your embargo or will break the breakdown briefing, you won't be invited to these in the future. And it is quite funny when we had a recent example where one newspaper did break that embargo. They were never invited on for a few months. And that journalist was like, I can't get information out of you, can't get information. But all the others were, they were getting their stories. What actually happened is that journalist said, yeah, I was a little bit, I shouldn't have done that, should I? Um, I realised actually I need to build a relationship with you and keep that relationship with you because actually you are the source of authority. You can give me that story. And in fact, my kind of behaviour made our newspaper lose out of stories where our competitors actually got a really good front page. So um, it is trust and you have to know where you can take risks. Um, yeah. uh, but it's something that, uh, and you have to be open and honest to those journalists when they break your trust, you really you know, quite clearly you broke my trust and you're not going to get it. You're not going to get the opportunities for a while. Um, and we, we have had to do that, but it's fun, quite funny uh, how quick that they come back to you and go, I had a briefing and you didn't call us. Well, it, uh, it, it is a tactic that they, they can be very successful, um, but it's not easy, particularly if you're new <clears throat> at an organisation or if, or if uh, you have a new product or something that's being launched. Trust is really important, but, but uh something you really have to work on. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, another question here from an anonymous. Uh, as a communications team, I believe we are well equipped to deal with a crisis. However, I do worry that in crisis, the organisation as a whole would struggle as the team is often overlooked, often finding out about a building issue only once it is right on the verge of crisis. Something I can relate to. How would you suggest getting through the importance of informing the comms team as soon as a potential issue arises? Um, I comms should always be at the table of, of, of a crisis, and and I would encourage everybody that when there is a crisis, uh, show show your presence. Uh, and and you know, example here, I, the chief of staff, uh, yeah. you know, I will be saying there's a comms issue. Um, is there any meetings? What's going on? Are the ex are the executive yeah. Yeah. meeting? What do you need from me? Can I come to it? Can I come a brief? Things like that. You've got to be at the top table uh, and comms should should play that part. It's not easy. And if you're not at that top table, how do you how do you, you know, keep the, the, the comms uh, relevance? Um, we we all work remotely. And I think that's something that uh, you know, hybrid working is not easy for us. But when there is a crisis, the team come in the office. Yeah. We all get together um, and we all and we're all we're all visible um, and all present. Uh, and you know we have a in our world here at the CAA there is some sort of crisis every few weeks about something. Uh, you know we've just had a we've just been working on one yeah. uh, in the last twenty four hours um, that could have been you know, pretty big on in the newspapers. Um, but the success of, of doing that is you know work with our legal team sits next to us. Here's our lines to take. Can you look at it? And we work together, uh, and that is that is how we do it. And it's great we do hybrid working, but actually sitting in a room with everybody uh, works. But get yourself around that table, and um, you know, show comms plays an important role. I think just to to build on Andrew's point there about how you could potentially build trust, I, I mentioned in in doing the presentation was actually test test scenario planning, test your organisation, how prepared are they, and then I think they may become a bit more in tuned the actual value that communications and communications colleagues can actually play within the scenario and that may help um, them giving you um, information sooner. Thanks both. Um, I'm going to go a little bit easier on you for the next question because it's coming from one of your colleagues, Henry Hemming at the UK CEA. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> um, and he's also been very flattering. You've had incredible careers and discussed rail. Have you noticed any differences or similarities to how you will handle a crisis at the CEA compared to how you did so when in rail or other industries? Oh, gosh. I think so, yes, because I think there's still, even when I was working at the, the railway regulator, uh, we still scenario planned. Mm -hmm. We still planned for, right, what, what could happen here and the lines to take and, and our kind of media handling, internal handling, um, and everything like that, because I, I started there during the pandemic uh, and no one was using the railways. Uh, and that in itself is, well, what are the safety risks here? What could happen? Uh, and then eventually, uh, sadly, there was obviously a rail crash um, up in Scotland that, that sadly three people 
um, lost their lives on it. It was, well, what's our response? How do we respond to that? And <clears throat> only a couple of weeks before, and this is, again, comes back to the point of, of relationships. We actually come out very positive for that because we put out a safety report two weeks before. I was then kind of informing Jess, look, we said this two weeks ago, and then new stories were, were looking at that um and, and picking off of that and that was through a trusted relationship with a journalist that was able to have that conversation and put the RR in a, in 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 a, in a good light um but i think there's still some similarities mm -hmm. because you always need to plan prepare and yeah. test um for crisis but what, yeah. what about yourself? i i would also say you know when i started in in the comms world about 15 years ago it was like uh, have we got a crisis comms manual and do we look at it and is it ready how many crises are we actually in? I've actually dusted it off the shelf and really used it. But it should be used as a principal document. You should have a manual, you should have your contacts, you should have your, your principles that you 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 uh, you operate. I think people get very fixated um, on, I've got to have a massive crisis comms manual with 200 pages and is it? No, have just something, a really principled uh, document. I think transferable skills I've seen uh, moving from airlines into the regulatory and also having been um, in, in rail as well, um, very similar. Um, and uh, it's it's that back to what we've said, build your relationships with your journalists, know them now, know them before a crisis starts, um, get to know them because when that happens, I remember the volcano back years and years ago when uh, the industry completely mm -hmm. shut down. I was working for EasyJet at the time, uh, Luton Airport, all the media outside, it was the cold weather, invite them into our canteen give them bacon butties, give them tea and coffee, uh, brief them and things like that. And funny, what do they go out on TV? We weren't actually able to give them that much information because it was a real difficult situation. But they're at least able to say EasyJet was actually looking after its customers. And we hear, you know, from EasyJet that it's been doing this, this and this this morning. It might not always be able to be on the record, but but having that, uh, that, uh, that sort of... Uh, relationships with those journalists absolutely works. So if you have a crisis, don't shut your door. Um, you know, be be open to journalists, and uh, you know when the phone rings, don't just ignore it. Um, you know, try and engage uh, where you can, and be very clear what's background. And I know they always say they always say nothing off the record these days, but you've really got to say this is clearly on background. Thanks, guys. Um, moving on, we've had a couple or two, three, four questions actually about the alignment with internal comms when in crisis um, in terms of ensuring consistency in the messaging and the updates that you give. Um, and also one specific example from Liz, um, how has internal comms factored in? I can imagine that the criticism around the spaceport affair was frustrating for staff to see. Any thoughts on how those two, two disciplines align in times of crisis? Uh, the most important thing is when you've got a crisis is tell your people. Tell your people and tell them uh, before. And tell them before. Uh, tell them before. So if you're making an announcement, uh, say at twelve o'clock. You know, make sure your internal announcement goes out ten minutes or so ahead of that. Let your people see see that story and and see and see that message. And making sure that you know, like we do here at the CAA, internal comp, we we all sat together. Um, and we but we don't think in that. Oh, you're external. You're stakeholders. We think as a communications team. Um, and that is something that helps us really, really focus um, and, uh, you know, tell your people first, um, let them hear. We do a new summary every morning uh, and it was like, well, that's, that's, you know, quite a resource heavy. But actually we want we want our people to see the good and the, the challenging things that we have to face as an organisation. We want our people to see that in the morning um, and, uh, you know, wake up and see where we are uh, out there. So we use that for our people. And I think just just to add on that point about linking up internally as well, it's is informing them what we are actually doing externally, that we are rebutting that piece, that we are speaking to that journalist, just so they know that something is being done about it and that we're not just sitting on it. We haven't just gone put your tin hats on and, and done nothing about it. I think that that's that's another key key aspect to that point as well. Thanks, both. Um, just building a little bit on you, you mentioned, Andrew, about um, sort of whacking great um, crisis plans that you, you may see around. So a question here saying, what would be the first aid package items a company should always have prepared? Should it be in template formats? Social media templates, pre-approved. If you're a complex organisation, make sure your legal team looked at that. 
make sure that your chief executive knows that in a crisis, these are my pre-approved statements. Get them signed up. Get your legal team um, to to look at it. Yes, they might need tweak. You might have X's on. You know, it is important that you have those those ready to go. We found so one of the the most challenging things we had here at the CAA uh, a number of years ago. There were just two people in the media team, and it was the day the Boeing seven three seven Max was was. Uh, being grounded, and we were the first regulator in the world to say we're banning them flying UK airspace. How do two people in a media team deal with that? Well, we had a, a social media post generally ready for that sort of scenario. We put it up on social media, and uh, and that certainly calmed the storm um, in the situation. So, uh, you know, social can be really useful, but having pre-approved statements and just getting getting people aligned, if we have that, what are we going to say? And we practice, and 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 uh, you know, we had one just just the other week where I, uh, you know, uh, sort of called the team up and said, um, "Crisis, crisis! Next half an hour, we're going to be operating. What would, what would be our line to take um, for this scenario?" And I think, as a company, we should regularly rehearse, um, and that can be quite difficult sometimes because mm-hmm. teams are maybe new or not used to that scenario. So do it locally with your teams or get partners. We're going to do uh, one with an airport uh, again soon. I won't tell my team we're doing that, um, but we are. We're going to be doing do, do one with an airport soon, and uh, just just build on your crisis uh, rehearsals um, is really really helpful, and just use live scenarios. Um, but look back, look back at how other organisations have done some. Look at case studies. If you're thinking in the cyber world, mm-hmm. you know, reading the media, how did Sainsbury's do it? Tesco, how's Greg's done it this week? What do they do? What was their response? What was their social media? Had their social media looked like? Were you like Greenwich Council or were you like Sainsbury's? So, and I think to add to that, there's some really good resources out there as well. The CRPR has its own crisis communications network uh, that, that put out some really useful resources as well. And then also uh, for us, we're, we're, we're part of kind of government communication service and they actually recently launched a new um, evaluation framework. And we've actually been kind of using that ourselves to kind of evaluate how we work in a crisis. And I think they also recently published um, something else to do with a crisis uh, and how you would map out right who's your, who who works on kind of bronze level who works on silver level who works on that kind of gold level so it's it's just going away look at the resources out there and 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 really do map it out some really helpful advice in there thanks both speaking about examples of those who've done well and those who perhaps done less well there's a question here i can't resist from sharon o'connor who asks, what do you think about the palace staying silent around the speculation about the Princess of Wales? And would you do things differently? It's a difficult one because it's someone's health. You know, we don't know what that situation is, but it, they're, in, they're in that vacuum. And at the moment, it looks like they can't do wrong. If it's the uh, photo gets snapped in a garden centre, or is they can't, they can't do wrong. But what they've got to do is come out of this with, with a uh, something that looks credible. They can't just do a, a a walking opportunity or something like that. They've got to come and, and, and look credible and they've got to tell the public in the best way they can uh, what's going on. Because when you get in that vacuum, as you can see, and particularly as social media and bots and things like that, you know, we saw, you know, in, in parts of the world, the king is dead this week. Um, you know, it's it's really challenging and bots are going to be make it even worse. Social media is 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 making it worse in these situations. But could they do better? I think they probably need to, as we do, be an end of a learning organization. If this happens again, how do we how do how do we deal with this? But but it's that transparency. You've got to be transparent. Um, and uh, you know, when you you might not be able to say something, but at least show confidence uh, and be transparent where you can. Thank you. We're sort of drawing towards the end, so if we've got any last questions, um, do ping them into us now. Um, one here from Farhan Ahmed. What do you do if there are internal disagreements on what to communicate in times of crisis? I think it's trying to find the balance. Um, I think that's it. You, you have to find the, the medium. You have to get around the room. And as I mentioned earlier about the, the, the common kind of issue that we're working on, is 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 easier to actually be in the room, talk about it, and actually go through the lines to take together, um, than actually ping ponging back emails and and disagreeing in that sense. Get together, get in a room, talk about it, uh, and find that medium. I'd say, yeah. Andrew, I I think we've all in our world spent uh, writing responses by committee, 
uh, and, and across emails, get in the room with the people, as, as Rob said. Uh, you know, committee writing is really hard, really painful. How many iterations of a, of, of a statement have you had? I think the worst in my career was 53 iterations to a statement, um, but that was extreme. That was an, 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 an extreme situation um, because of some really technical nature um, of that, but but that's an extreme. Uh, try and get that down to really low digits where you can. Uh, one specifically here about some of the, well, one of the examples you called out at the start of the presentation, uh, Thomas Cook, how much prep or advance warning did you have in on that occasion and how did you use it? It's interesting because obviously uh, as a regulator, we are constantly watching the industry, watching the sector. Uh, we are always horizon scanning. There is very much a, what we can, what I can publicly say on this call um, of, of how much notice um, do we get? Um, and there is obviously uh, planning and intelligence that we receive. Um, but that's why we have plans, we have preparations, we have things on standby. Uh, we know that if this happens tomorrow, what do we do? We know where our TV facility is. We know those airlines are on standby. Uh, we know organisations like VMA can help us out uh, and get great comms people if we need them. Um, but it is... Um, you know, notice uh, on those sometimes can be a period, um, but airlines like Flybe, when they collapsed, uh, you know, just before the pandemic, we were in work in the morning, got told about nine o'clock, by four o'clock that afternoon, the airline had collapsed. And so um, that's why you have to have big plans, but you have to have statements ready um, and, uh, you know, just, just, just be prepared. And you know, if there's anything from today, uh, you know, take a quiet day in the next few days and just say, am I ready for a crisis? If it was a cyber, how would I deal with it? If it was this, it was that, how would I deal with it? And just have a have a prep time with, with, with yourself and go, it's not easy. Um, and, uh, but just, just, you know, do your prep, do your preparation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, last question, I suspect for now. How do you manage a senior stakeholder who's very keen to get in front of journalists, but in whom you don't have sufficient faith to do the right thing? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I would probably say train them, yeah. uh, to be brutally honest. We put several of our senior leaders through, through media training to make sure that they are prepared. But sometimes, yes, if we don't have confidence that they'll be able to deliver the message, we may look and say that, no, you're not the right person for this and go to the the, the, the person that we want to put up and we know that yeah. would would do a good job. But but 100% train your top spokespeople um, and do the training yourself. Uh, myself and Andrew have done have done media training ourselves and it's, it's great to put yourself through that because if if you're not comfortable putting your, your senior leadership up, team up, you could do the interview yourself. Yeah. Great advice. So I think we should wrap things up there um, just with a really big thank you, first of all, to Robert and Andrew. Thank you for your time and your honesty and engagement today. It's really fascinating to hear from you both. Um, thank you to, all, to you all on the line for engaging. Thanks for sharing in our polls. Thanks for firing questions at us. It's great. And the sessions really only work as effectively as they do when you do that. So thank you for your engagement. Um, please tune into the next one, which will be in a few weeks' time. Keep an eye on VMA's page for details of that. And enjoy the rest of your day. Great to see you. Thanks all. Thanks all. See you later. Bye-bye.